okay? This is actually the first time I've done this totally live. My dog is an expert at this, but <laughs> hopefully by the end of it, you will also be an expert in it. Yes, there's a question back there. Yes, the, the TIFF, yeah, yeah. Yes, so if you're using the USB, then I just saved you a step. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm, who am I? I'm, my name is Carson. Um, I am a assistant professor of GI science at um, Hunter College, City University of New York. So some of the examples and things, alumni? Nice, right on, excellent. Uh, so some of the examples are New York-based because uh, there's excellent free data available uh, from New York. Also, quite a few of the examples and things are actually based on a talk that Kelsey gave last year at this very conference. Okay. Uh, I also work in a lab uh, called CARSI, Center for Advanced Research of Spatial Information, uh, and that's kind of what I call myself these days, I guess. Computational social science, spatial stats person, Whatever you want, hey you, usually works too. Um, and so that's what I do during the day. And then at night, uh, I uh, play around with Python quite a bit. Um, back in 2007, I developed a vector menu for QGIS, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end, hopefully. Um, and at that time, uh, it was all just pure uh, Python standard libraries. Now there's awesome stuff that would you know, basically makes what I did uh, useless, but at the time it was great and helpful, I, I think. So I'll show you how to make great and helpful things uh, for QGIS, as well as uh, just general Python geospatialness. Uh, and then uh, my favorite thing right now is GeoPandas, which I'm going to introduce you to today, and then uh, Kelsey is also giving a talk on Tuesday, which will give you the real rundown on, on that project. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So. Hopefully, um, the reason you're here is that you're in the correct room and you want to learn about geospatial libraries for Python. Um, I'm guessing there's a fairly wide range of research and topic and data interests here. Um, as I said, I'm a social scientist. I've tried to use examples that will apply in various different contexts. Um, but if you have any questions about, you know, well, how would I do this with this type of data that I use every, every day, please don't hesitate to pipe up and ask. Um, and just uh, to get an idea, if someone's here from a sort of where they think I'm not expecting them to come from field, yell it out. Like, you know, something like, um, I don't know, astronomy or something like that, which I wouldn't expect there would be a lot of people doing that. Or maybe, uh, you know, yes. Finance. Finance, cool. Okay. That's good. Uh, the rest of you are all geographers then. Yep. Cool, great, okay. Uh, no specific examples about that, but most of this stuff will apply. Actually, whatever you tell me, I'll just tell you that most of this stuff applies to that. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, cool, definitely did not expect that. Okay, uh, so hopefully, yeah, by the end of this, I guarantee you, you'll find some um, useful application areas here. So today I'm talking about geospatial data in Python. Um, so I'm gonna kind of break it up into <coughs> geospatial and data even though really it should be, be geospatial data and then more data, but uh, geospatial and data. So I'm going to uh, kind of break it up into location and information. Okay, so location being spatial is special and we've got to do all sorts of special things for it. And information being spatial isn't all that special and here's just a few tools to make it easier to work with it. Okay, um, so we're going to cover things like projections and, and coordinate reference systems. Although this is not like GIS 101 or something like that, so I'm going to gloss over it pretty quickly with mostly just pictures. Um, how we actually represent location, I'm going to talk about, because that's kind of relevant for some of the libraries we're going to work with. And then different data formats and how we read and write them and things like that. And then when it gets to the data part of it, um, I'm going to kind of suggest that um, geospatial data is really just another type of data, just like a float or an int or a string, and there's quite a few tools that we can use to just operate properly on this type of data. Excuse me. Uh, and then, of course, this, the third part is Python, because I'm talking about geospatial data for Python. Um, so throughout the slides, there's always going to be a how do I do this in Python 
kind of uh, thread to it. And so I'll talk about how to use coordinate reference systems, how to look at and represent different spatial representations, uh, how to actually play around with it, how to plot it, and we'll do some static plots, and we'll do some uh, web-based plots. And the last example in uh, slide four is basically pulling stuff from a database, doing some stuff with it, and throwing it on a map in like, I don't know, ten, max 10 lines of code or something like that, which is pretty cool. So when we get there, you'll be impressed. Um, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about open source libraries for all this stuff, some Pythonic stuff, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do any analysis. We're not going to like do statistical or modeling or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to talk about web mapping per se. I'm just going to show you how to make a web map without actually knowing that you're making a web map. A um, little bit about desktop integration, and I hope if we have time, some QGIS stuff. That may end up just being a demo more so than an actual exercise, but we'll see. And if I talk too fast or too slow, oh, if I talk too fast, give me one of these, okay? If I talk too slow, give me one of these. I learned this at uh, PyData. It's very helpful, okay? And then if I'm doing it just right, one of these, okay? <laughs> Great. Okay. Phew. Thank goodness. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to start by talking about coordinate reference systems and map projections, okay? So if you've worked with uh, spatial or geographic data before, um, chances are you've, you know, had to deal with coordinate reference systems. If you've used a GIS before and your map doesn't show where it's... <coughs> you know, where it show up where it's supposed to be, it's because you got something wrong somewhere along the line with the coordinate reference system or the projection that you are using. And pretty much, regardless of where you go, there's going to be some problems. You're going to try and get some data from here, display it with data from here, do some sort of overlay, and nothing's going to work. And that's because there's different projections and different coordinate reference systems for pretty much every different thing that you could possibly want to do. So every state has its own state plane coordinate reference system, okay? And for the most part, they can't really, you can't really use one coordinate reference system for one state with another one. Some of them use the same projection, but they use different coordinates or a coordinate reference system, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, there's lat and long. Why don't we all just use that? Because that's the same everywhere. And the reason is lots of different reasons. One, uh, it's not so great for measuring distances. We've got to use geodesic distance instead of straight line distance. Uh, because sometimes we want to put stuff on a map and therefore need to project it somehow. And so we need projections, and we need coordinate systems for those projections and all sorts of things. Uh, this is a list of ones that I use sometimes. It's, why, it's only ones I can think of off the top of my head. Um, we use Web Mercator or Google Mercator a lot because um, that's what Google uses, and so we all use that. And cartographically speaking, it's very useful. It's useful for only, you know, very... Specific things like, you know, drawing a map of how to get from the airport to the conference center. But if you're trying to represent things like choropleth maps or densities or things like that, then it's not such a great projection. And in fact, we want something that preserves area better. So uh, we have to keep all these things in mind, okay? And this is uh, pretty cool. This is a D3 visualization of morphing between various different projections. Um, and as you can see, as we change the projection, the representation of the data, what we actually visualize and see, changes quite a lot. And so we end up using Mercator a lot, um, and it's only good for, you know, a few things. Uh, it totally warps things up at the poles, right? So this is not really, like, sizes here are, are very misrepresented. Maybe we want to use something like an equal area projection, so we can use my favorite, which is Mallweed. Whoop, that didn't work. Uh, which represents area much better. And so all of these different things, when we're representing information, we have to keep this into account. When we're making maps, when we're, uh, when we're calculating distances, when we're calculating areas, right? You don't want to calculate areas on coordinates that are stored in Google Mercator. You would rather do it in something like Mallweed or some area-preserving projection. Um, so, yeah, so that's fun, and you can play around with that in the slides if you want as well. That's pretty much like the thing that slowed up my slides the most. The other thing is, if you use the wrong projections, then things can happen. Bad things can happen. Uh, so this is the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. I can use that example because I lived there and worked with them. So it's okay. 
Uh, and here is a mistake where the roads don't line up in a map of, um, of the officially uh, um, referenced roads. Okay, so they used two different uh, projections, tried to put them together, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so that's obviously not good. So things uh, happen when you use the wrong coordinate system. Uh, so we have to make sure we use the right one. And there are lots of different tools and um, ways to do that. Okay? So because everybody has their own projection, right? if I wanted, I could have the Carson Farmer coordinate reference system and associated projection. And uh, I could have made you all use that one for this uh, tutorial or something like that. And then I could have, anyway, we didn't do that. And uh, because everybody does have their own, some people who use projections quite a lot went along and collected a database of them to help organize things. So that's the European Petroleum Survey Group, which actually is not called that anymore. And the reason that the European Petroleum Survey Group have this database, the EPSG database, is because they were going around you know, drilling and looking for oil all over the world in different places, and they needed to work in the local uh, coordinate reference system and projection. So they compiled themselves a database so that they could know what projection to use when they were where and why and with who. So um, you can click on that link uh, if you want. It takes you to a pretty boring website, with, which is the database for um, EPSG. So what it is is a, is a data set with a bunch of coordinate reference systems and transformations. And there's a web interface that you can query to figure out which one you should use in different places, um, which is very handy. Some kind of common ones, EPSG, if, you, if you use Latin long data, just memorize EPSG 4326. That's, that's Latin long WGS84. Just memorize that one. Okay, go. And then um, another one that gets used a lot is EPSG 3857, or what used to be 900913, which spells Google in numbers. So that's the uh, Google um, or web, uh, web Mercator projection. Okay, I think most applications will let you use either one, but this is the real one. Okay, and then we're going to work with some data from New York, and that uses the New York State Plane projection, uh, which is 2263. Okay, don't memorize that one. Um, I'll always give you those, these codes. Anyway, the reason I'm giving you these codes will become relevant later on. Uh, spatialreference.org is also a useful website, um, which you can use to search for different uh, projections and which ones and which areas you should use. Okay, so that's just a useful resource for you. This is what um, the website looks like, and so you can click here, and if you know the projection or know the name of the EPSG code, you can search for it, and that's very handy. Um, but I've given you the codes for everything that you're going to need for today. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so the reason we're here is to learn how to do some of this stuff in Python. Okay, so how do we work with projections in Python? Um, or in general, pretty much any uh, uh, geospatial application these days. Uh, two things. First, we need Proj4, which is a cartographic projections library. Okay. Um, and it's pretty much a, a, a C++ library that has a bunch of known projections and coordinate transformations that one might need in one's everyday uh, interaction with geospatial data. So pretty much handles a lot of the stuff that's in the EPSG database. Okay, so it allows us to convert coordinates between these different projections or coordinate reference systems. Okay? It is a project under the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. Anybody know what that is? Okay, it's like an umbrella um, organization around, well, it's an umbrella organization around open source geospatial applications. Kind of uh, what you'd think with a name like that. Um, so here is their web, nope, somewhere around here is their website. Um, and they do pretty much all uh, open source geospatial applications and they're a sort of incubator, they have incubator programs and things like that. So QGIS is one, um, uh, PostGIS is one, a lot of the libraries we're going to talk about today are, are part of this uh, OSGEO foundation. So that's just sort of like a plug for them. Okay. Um, okay, so Proj4, this C++ library. Obviously, none of us want to write C++ code, so uh, PyProj uh, basically wraps that for us in Python. 
Okay, and so it's the Python inter interface to Proj4 library. There's a link to it there if you want. Um, and it's pretty cool because it's optimized for running, uh, like reprojecting uh, things that support the Python um, buffer protocol. So you can run it on NumPy arrays and you can do like a whole array of points really quickly. Um, and means that we can transfer between different coordinate reference systems quite easily. And I'll show you some examples of how easy it is in a little bit here. Um, so we can do cartographic uh, transformations and we can do geodetic computations, so calculating distances on spheres and things like that. Uh, and it's super handy and it's MIT licensed, so we can use it pretty much wherever we want, which is great. And I'm going to mention the licenses for all of these Python libraries so that you can say, oh, well, I can use that in my super secret, top secret proprietary software package if you want. Um, okay, so here is an example. Now, now is a good time if you have the uh, things downloaded on your uh, computer somewhere and you have IPython notebook running, you can open notebook one. Okay, and you should see some code that looks like this, although it hasn't been run yet. Yes? <coughs> Sorry for the interruption. No problem. I got the notebook. Where is the, where is the presentation? The, the pre no, the presentations aren't in there because I changed them at like five minutes ago. So they, they're, but they're, if you go to the GitHub site, there's links to the live presentations if you want them. Yeah, they're just in a Dropbox public folder, so they were changed very recently. Um, so you want, if you want the latest presentation, the links are on the GitHub site. Okay, so you'll see something that looks like this, and um, it's you know not a lot of uh, stuff going on. This first line from PyProj import proj, pretty standard stuff uh, for Python. So from that package import a projection class. Okay, um, and then this line here we just instantiate one, and we use this excuse me init initialize the projection for EPSG 3857, all right, which was the EPSG code for Web Mercator. So basically what we're saying is we're going to create a proj object which is based on the, project, the Web Mercator projection. Okay, um, And we create that and I'll call it P. Why not? And then it's very simple. If you want to convert, say, from long lat coordinates, and mo note that I say long lat, X, Y, not lat long, okay? X and Y, long and lat. Um, so you just put in long, lat, and you, um, as, a, as you know, two arguments, and I'm just calling print here, and what I get right here is the coordinates converted to Web Mercator um, coordinates. Okay, so I went from long, lat, to X and Y in the Web Mercator projection. Okay, pretty simple, just one quick little command. And then I can go backwards. So if I just take these, put them back in there, and put inverse equals true, then I convert back into long lat. Yes? Um, so it looks like Py, PyProj has like a whole EPSG sort of database embedded in it, I mean a list of all those projections. Pretty much. It's, it's actually the C++ library Proj4, which has pretty much all of the EPSG um, uh, database in it. Okay. And then PyProj is using that. So is there a way using the module to get like a list of all of those supported projections? Or uh, I don't know. Probably better off going to the website. I'd, I have no idea. Um, there would be a lot, though. Like a lot, tons of them, hundreds, possibly thousands. Um, but if you go to the yeah, if you go to the website and find the one you want there, then ninety nine percent of the time it will be also in here, and they get added all the time. Yes. Uh, very basic question: When you convert, you get minus one hundred eight million, whatever it is. What is that number? What are, what are the units? Uh, the units are actually meters in this case. But the units will be whatever the units are for that particular projection. And most of these projections will have a default unit. 
associated with it. So in this case, it's meters. Uh, I can't remember where the where the for wherever the origin for that projection is, which I cannot remember. Yeah, for I don't know. It's probably Google Mercator is probably somewhere, and the Pacific is probably zero. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe yeah. Um, anyway, so there you go. And yeah, so the, most of them are in there. Uh, you can also specify a custom projection, so you don't have to use the ones in the database. And we'll sh I'll show some examples of that later on. Actually, it might be right now. Yes, I'll show that right now. OK. Uh, so um, just because it's handy, um, we're going to use something a package called Fiona a little bit later. But I'm importing it now just because it's got this handy function called um, to, or from string and to string. And it's for working with things called proj4 strings, OK? Proj4 is that library that contains all these different databases. It also allows you to define arbitrary projections and datums and coordinate systems, OK? So in this case, what I have, so I've imported from Fiona.crs a few handy little tools, OK? And I'm creating a, something, a, an object called CRS, which will be a dictionary, Python dictionary. Um, which we're creating from this string. Okay, and that string looks very complicated, and I'll, I shall explain it now. So that string has various different parameters that are defined in the proj4 library, and each one describes a part of the pro a projection. Okay? So in this case, the, the plus proj, that is the actual proje the projection that we're going to use. In this case, it's Lambert Conformal Conic, okay? LCC, Lambert Lambert Conformal Conic. Google that if you want to know about that projection. Okay? And then it gives various different uh, latitude and longitude, or, like origin, latitude, origin, longitude, um, some offsets, and various different parameters. Okay? And you can actually get this Proj4 string for existing projections from the database, the EPSG database, if you wanted it. But if you have some sort of arbitrary projection that you want to use, oh gosh. <laughs> This is why I don't like Java. Remind me later. OK. Uh, yeah, so you, I don't know what I just said, but something about uh, arbitrary coordinate reference systems. Here I can specify the ellipse, right? the, the actual shape of the globe that I'm assuming um, we're using. And here's um, so a parameter for converting to WGS84, Latin long. And here's the units. I specify the units. So your question earlier about what units they're in. Usually the proj4 library or string will define that. So in this case, it's US feet. OK? Um, OK, so that's an arbitrary um, uh, projection string. And the cool thing is I can, just, I can use that just like I did before. So I create something called New York City proj, and it's just proj using that CRS. Right? And I wanted to make sure to preserve the units, because I want to use units and feet. So I say preserve units equals to true. Okay, so that's pretty cool because now I can, I can um, create arbitrary projections. Now, this one's actually not quite arbitrary because I actually st pretty much stole this from the EPSG database for New York state plane uh, projection, right? So it should be pretty, uh, should kind of already exist. But here is the one where I used an arbitrary string. Here I did the same thing except as before I used an EPSG code. And again, I want to preserve units. Okay. And in theory, if I copied the string and it's accurate enough, they should be pretty much the same, right? Um, hopefully. Uh, and they're pretty close, right? There's probably some rounding errors and things like that, uh, floating point errors, I don't know. Um, so anyway, here's, this is my office. Down, fairly accurate, so come visit. Um, and uh, I just convert my office uh, using the first one to um, state plane coordinates. And then I convert my office coordinates using the EPSG code version to <laughs> state plane coordinates. And to, I don't know, a lot of decimal places, they're the same. So that's proof. So bonus for that. OK, so that kind of shows you you can, you can specify arbitrary projections. You can use, no problem, you can use um, projections from a database, whatever, and you can interact with different data. Uh, that little star is um, maybe new to some people. I'm going to explain what that is in a little bit. Um, you can think of it as unpacking. I'm unpacking 
this tuple here. But I'll, I'll talk about that more in a sec. Okay, so, so with me so far, pretty simple, right? Working with projections in Python. So here's an example where we're going to make some plots where projections are important, okay? Plotting examples. So we're going to use CartoPy, which I really like, um, particularly for plotting on uh, different uh, projections and things like that, okay? So uh, here's an example on the internet um, called The Effect of Badly Referencing an Ellipse. Oh, good, okay. Um, and basically, this is kind of a little plot showing what happens if you pick the wrong ellipsoid for your uh, projection and you plot it, okay? So the white one is correct and it lines up nicely with the underlying um, image and the other one is an incorrect uh, ellipse sphere, okay? So that's an example and there you can, I've given you a link to it. You can go, you can copy and paste that, you can play around with it. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that one too much uh, because it requires all sorts of imports and things like that, which you should have if everything worked. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, uh, there's also some base map examples if you want to click on those as well. Um, here are other examples of CardoPy. Okay. Um, we're going to do something like this one in a little bit. Okay, which is plotting the path of Hurricane Katrina. Okay, um, but as you can see, you can do all sorts of different um, maps with different projections, and in this case, we're also going to do this, uh, where we're actually plotting correct uh, great circle distances rather than crazy straight lines on a map that d doesn't uh, facilitate that. Okay, so there's lots of examples there, and. You know, some of them are like impressively simple, like this one, which I'm going to show you in a few seconds, so there's no need to show you there. Okay, so play around with those. That's basically a slide that shows you go to the CartoPy website and play around with examples. They're pretty simple. Uh, FYI, yes? Quick question. Um, at some point, if you have time, could you talk about if you have thoughts about the difference between base map and CartoPy? Um, Sure, I can. T uh, we'll do that later. How about just so sure. that we stay on track? But I'm happy okay. to do that. Mostly, I just don't like having to install Base Map. Okay. Um, okay. So here's an example: uh, plotting this volcano. Uh, so you may remember 2010 volcano erupted, disrupted like all air traffic con uh, in Europe. My wife was in the south of France at the time, and the airline had to pay for her extended holiday. So that was great. So that's why I use this example. She thought that was wonderful. It didn't cost me a dime, and she got an extra long vacation in the south of France. So volcanoes are good, and mapping them uh, is also good. So in this case, uh, we're just pr pretty much using PyPlot. And if you're, cop if you're following this example in an IPython notebook or a Qt console... Um, then you can import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. I always do that. And then if you use this uh, magic thing, uh, which is percentage matplotlib inline, then any of the plots that you make will be inline, uh, i.e. they'll be you know, right in the um, uh, uh, notebook. Thank you. Okay. Um, FYI, this example does require an internet connection because we're going to pull um, data from the internet. So uh, if you don't have a proper internet connection, it may not work properly. Okay, but I've got an example that does work properly right here, so we should be good. Okay, so we import that, set up inline. I guess I could just do this stuff here, okay? So then we're going to uh, import cardopy.crs, coordinate reference system, as ccrs. That seems to be the convention that they use for the CartoPy example, so let's stick with that. Uh, apparently I imported matplotlib twice. Never can be sure, right? So I don't know why I did that. That was an accident. Uh, and then we're going to import uh, cartopy.io.im underscore tiles as this, this CIMGT. Uh, this is a module that lets us uh, download and display um, web map tiles. So we can put like a Google Maps background or a, um, I'm going to use a MapQuest background because they're 
user license agreements are um, more reasonable than Google's. Uh, and you can use all sorts of different ones. You can also do arbitrary ones. Uh, so if you like the stamen map tiles, you can do those ones as well. Uh, doing this in Python may be against the end user license agreements of some of these web, web mapping services, so be careful. Uh, okay, so what we do is we just create a, an, object, an object called MapQuest Arial, which is going to download and display the MapQuest uh, web map tiles for us. Okay? Yes? Is her copy in the um, pip repository? Uh, you can install it with pip. If uh, the easiest way to do it is actually to install it like direct, right from the GitHub um, repo. So if you do pip install git plus and then the link to git, you may have to pip install Cython first. Okay, and that you can just do pip install <coughs> Cython. Uh, there also on the install thing, there was a there was a, an example to. Uh, pull it if you're using Anaconda. You can get it using Conda um, with this extra little trick. Um, so if you're using a Conda environment, it might be a good idea to do that so that everything works nicely. Um, I usually just pip install everything, but uh, whatever tickles your fancy. Uh, right, so that's there. And then just for shits and giggles, I decided to print the coordinate reference system that the MapQuest Arial thing uses, just so you can see what it is. And as you can see, uh, the projection is Mercator. Okay, units are meters. So there's that, that question earlier. Um, oh, okay, so the origin is at, um, uh, whatchamacallit in England? <coughs> Greenwich, thank you. Um, and then these are the offsets for it, A and B offsets. These are just um, uh, some parameters that I'm not going to explain. Okay, so that's the proj4 string that, that they, those projections are going to use. So when we're making a map, if we're downloading these tiles and they're in a particular projection, it's probably a good idea to plot things using that projection. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so here is the coordinates for the volcano with the long, with the long name. And um, here's just a kind of extent that I specified so that my map, map only takes up that extent. Okay. And the transform that I'm going to use is geodetic uh, because I've specified these in lat long coordinates, okay? So those are geodetic coordinates, not projected coordinates, okay? So I'm going to create an object which is a geodetic non-projection, okay? Everybody with me so far? And voila, here is what you get, all right? So top line, make a figure, make it 10 by 8, it's pretty arbitrary. Um, create a, uh, an, a geo axes object, okay? So plot dot axes and specify the projection to be the projection of those map tiles that we're going to download, okay? So that we're working with the same projection. Uh, I'm going to set the extent to the extent that I specified just a second ago. And um, I'm just going to add the map quest image. And the cool thing is, is I just specify the map quest, uh, map quest object, and then I tell it at what uh, zoom level I want to download the images at, and then uh, CardoPy will automatically download uh, the image that is required to fill the space of my map, which is pretty handy. So I'm specifying a zoom level of 8. Um, you do kind of have to be careful about what zoom level you specify, because if you specify a too high of a zoom level, it's going to download like hundreds of tiles. It's going to use up all of our bandwidth, and probably MapQuest won't like you very much if you do it a lot. So um, you kind of have to be careful about what zoom level to use. So for kind of big regional stuff, numbers are smaller, and for zoomed into like urban areas, numbers are bigger. Okay, so eight is a pretty good one uh, this for this sort of thing. Uh, add, add image yes. Uh, so imshow would be, which we're going to use later, it would be for displaying an image that you have stored, you know, in your... Um, Workspace somewhere, and add images for adding. It's specifically for geo axes, and it's for adding these map tile images. It, you know, they could have called it add tile, probably. Maybe it would have been more intuitive for this particular application, but anyway. Okay, so we add the image, and then we plot just the one point.
okay, which I called Volcano, and again I use that little star um, thing, the unpacking thing, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then a few things to make it look the right color um, and the right size, and then I specify the transform that I'm using. In this case, it's a, I'm using Latin long, so I specify the transform as geodetic, okay, which I did here. Okay, so I use that. Uh, give it a nice little title, plot.show, et voila, we have a plot of the volcano. And that's the point, that's the volcano right there. Uh, in the example, there's a, this example I took from the Cardo Pi website. In the example on the website, it actually shows you how to add a label for the, um, for the volcano, but that's more complicated than, we, than necessary because you've got to create a uh, transform for text and all sorts of that stuff. So for the purposes of what we're doing right now, we don't need to worry about it. But you can go through that example if you want. Um, and uh, so there you go. And then this is a um, MapQuest, uh, what is it called? Open, uh, open aerial image, right? Which was downloaded from the internet, displayed on our browsers. How many people got that to work in their IPython notebook. Super duper. Bonus points for you guys. Um, great. Okay. Yes. Who's got the USB key? Okay. Okay. So ends uh, works or the part part one. Okay. So, if you have the IPython notebooks open, you should just be able to click, yours might not look like this, but there should be a link that you can click, and it should now open the exercise notebook. I'm hoping that it does. Great. Okay, so I'm going to click mine. Bam. Opens a notebook. Uh, let's just make this bigger, perhaps. Okay, and it'll probably look something kind of like this. All right, this one I'm going to kind of go through with you so that we all get used to working with the notebooks together. Also, there's very little actual thinking involved in this one. Uh, but in uh, later ones, thinking will be required, so get ready for that. Um, okay, so is there, uh, how many people are with me on this? They've got a notebook open. Very few, actually. Okay. Uh, how many people don't have it but really wish they did? <laughs> okay. Taylor, do you think you could help those uh, couple people over there get it set up? Uh, and over on this side of the room? Maybe. Almost. Oh, okay. Uh, well, good news, you don't need it right away. Yes, you do, but for the exercise, you don't. Oh, where'd you get popcorn? Awesome. There's popcorn outside, guys. Uh, so after this quick little exercise, maybe run and grab some popcorn and run back while I switch slides. Okay? Uh, okay, I'm going to keep going. This one's super simple. Uh, and so I don't mind coming back to it later if um, someone in, ends up behind while they get some help, okay? Okay, so this one's called Working with Projections in Python, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to be converting coordinates, kind of like I showed you before, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this is exercise one. Or it's actually, called, it's actually called Working with Projections. It's in the exercises folder. If you have notebook one open, at the bottom of that notebook, there's a link to open this exercise. Who needs the USB? It's ready to go. Okay. Okay, so working with projections. Right, so open it up, and here we go. So what I have given you here, okay, is the location of this very conference center, as far as I could determine. Um, in the local state plane coordinate reference system. Okay, for this area. I have not told you what that coordinate reference system is. Uh, so, one thing you could do is you could go to the EPSG database website and try and figure out how to find it. Uh, or, 
I've actually provided a list of all the state plane coordinate reference systems that the U.S. uses, which is like 123 or something like that. And it's a CSV file, and you could open up the CSV file, search through it, and find the one for Texas, this part, this particular part that we need. Um, and so I'll show you how to do that. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to assume later on that you at least kind of know a little bit about Python. And this is, or uh, sorry, Python, obviously you know a little bit about Python. Uh, pandas, and this is a way for me to test that right now. Um, okay, so your task is to figure out the correct state plane reference zone and then convert the above coordinates to lat long, which is EPSG 4326, which I told you to memorize. Okay? Uh, so, just to remind you of how things work, here's an example, right? In, from PyProj import proj, create a uh, proj object in web mercator, and then um, these are actually, just so you know, these are the coordinates in lat long, so you could just kind of like fake it, I guess. But wouldn't be doing any good. So those are the coordinates, and these are the coordinates in um, uh, Web Mercator. Okay, so I'm, they're not, it's not the um, state plane coordinate reference system. This is an example using a different reference system just to get you going. So if you take your mouse and you put it in this first cell, okay, and then you hit control return, and I do mean control return, even if you're on a Mac, it's still control return, or you push this button, this play button here, it should, everybody fingers crossed, run and not throw any errors. Excellent. Step one complete. We have created an object called P, which is the proj uh, object for EPSG um, 3857, which is Google's Web Mercator. Okay? Now, if I hit the down button or I put my mouse in here and I hit control enter again, what I shall get is the lat and long coordinates converted to Google Mercator or Web Mercator projections or coordinates. Yes? Excellent? This is, this is where you guys can give me these things to kind of. Okay, good. Um, it's shift enter for me. It's what now? It's shift enter. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe it depends on the iPython well, notebook version you're using. One of them actually compiles and moves to the next one, and one of them just... Oh, yes, that's right. That's correct, yes. It stays in the cell that the mouse is in. That's oh. control, I guess. Wait, yeah. so shift, yeah. enter... Shift, enter will make a new code block. No, shift, enter just moves down to the next one. I did not know that. Thank you. That was great. That's going to save us nanoseconds. Okay. Well, it's better than by mouse, yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so, yes, I did that. And then I did the inverse, just because I can. So I've done that. It's happened. Okay? So that's the example uh, where you already know what you want to do. Okay, so if you mouse down or move down or whatever you want, shift enter down into this one, I'm going to have you import pandas as PD, the safest typing, and then import um, OS os as well. And then you can run this and it's going to um, create a data frame, pandas data frame. How many people know about pandas? Excellent. I figured, I figured as much. Okay. So it's a pandas data frame. Uh, we've created it. Now you can query the pandas data frame to find the EPSG code that you need to then create a proj object to convert the coordinates into Latin law. Okay. As you can see, the solution is not up there. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to figure it out. If you figure it out fast, you can run and get some popcorn. Uh, if you don't, I will show you the solution shortly. Okay? And if you want to cheat and skip ahead, the solution is in a notebook called Working with Projections, Space, Bracket, Ands, Bracket. It's in the same folder. Okay? So there you go. So do that. Okay, if I, if I run this now, oh, yes, and I did this on purpose. I didn't fix my version just in case this would happen. Um, so see, you, you see I have this error here. It seems that the latest version of Pandas doesn't play nicely with the late, latest version of OpenPyXL. Pi, yeah, PyXL. Uh, 
So there's actually instructions on how to fix that in the install guide, uh, but just so you know, it actually doesn't matter. If you have this, it's not going to affect anything anyway. But if, if you don't like errors like I don't, you could go and fix it using the install instructions. Of course, the next version probably won't require you to do that, so you know, spend your time as you see fit. Okay, so go. Use uh, DF, data frame. Um, right, DF, this is what it looks like. Okay, so it's got, this is the state plane coordinate system code. Okay, don't worry about that. Here's the name, and here's the EPSG code. So you should be able to search on the name column to find uh, a relevant projection. So I will give you uh, like seven minutes or something to do that. And then we'll, I'll show you the solution. Uh, in the meantime, if you're still having install troubles, I can come around and help as well. So hands up if you do. Yep. You're only cheating yourself. Um, maybe for a later uh, exercise, I'll have a competition, and whoever gets it first wins something. Some candy. Over here. Uh, oh, I, you still have a few minutes. Don't worry. Oh.
working so. USB? Thank you. 
Um, <laughs> bonus points again. No, there isn't. So if you just keep doing that, it'll actually be the one in the correct order. Ooh, Swedish fish, thanks. Okay, that's enough. Uh-oh. So here is my answer to that task of yours. Okay, you've already done this stuff. Here we have our error here. Um, so I use some handy dandy stuff that we're going to use. No, we're not going to use this later. So show me data frame where data framed the name column. And then, anybody know about this string namespace? It's pretty cool. If you've got a string field, then you can do, like, so name is a string field. And if you do name.string, then it gives you all sorts of, like, additional operators and things that you can do on it. And it does it by element. Pretty handy. So this is just a quick and dirty way to do it. There's other ways you could do it where you just search for the string in the column and stuff. Anyway, data frame dot name dot string dot contains Texas, and we get a bunch of rows here. And then, what you may not have known is whether you should pick a NAD twenty seven or a NAD eighty three. Anybody know what the difference is between those two? Well, well, year it depends on the lab. Yeah, yeah, and it can be a huge problem if you get the two wrong. Um, About fifty six so, years. Pardon? About fifty six years. Yeah, well, yes, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, so a North American datum 
83, North American data 27. Uh, we'll use the 80, NAD 83. And um, Austin is in the south central zone of Texas. So that means that, uh, oh, here we go. That means that the Proj4 string is 32140. So how many people did it this way, and how many people just went on the internet and found it? <laughs> we did it that way? No, that's not true. Great, great. The internet way is way easier. But just in case we didn't have internet, I thought I'd give you that. Mm, they're data, so it's a datum. Um, yeah, well, it depends where you are. The difference, is, it's, it's a difference in datum, so the sort of origin for the ellipsoid. And if you get it, if you, if your data is stored in, say, NAD83 coordinates, and you specify NAD27, depending on where you are on the planet, you could be off by as much as, I don't know what's the maximum you can be off by probably a couple kilometers. In, in the U.S., I think it's up to about 200 meters. Okay. Outside oh, so that's US actually not more. so bad. At the, outside the U.S., it could be more. Those are both U.S. data. But yeah. If, well, North American data. NAD 27 is, is a U.S.-based one, and NAD 83 is basically WGSC. The reason. Like <laughs> well, I mean, we're always using, like, you know, approximations anyway, so... <laughs> At the end of the day, it's always wrong, but um, depends on, yeah, so it could be off by meters or feet or whatever. Depends where, but it's the datum that you, that's the difference. In your answer, you say uh, 721188. That's what I see in the actual question. Uh oh. Oh no, that's the uh, that's the example where we convert it to Web Mercator. These are the coordinates right here at the top. You see at the top of the exercise. So the first part was just we were just converting it to Web Mercator, just as an example. The second part we're converting it to the local state plane. So these are right. And so the goal is to get these numbers, which, as you can see, are pretty close to these numbers. So if you got that to work, you at least know the coordinates for this place. Whether you can find your way back here tomorrow or not is a different thing. Okay, so if there are any more questions about that, I can um, answer them later on uh, after we move on to the next thing. Uh, okay. I need to get out of here. Part two. All right. Welcome to tutorial part two. Uh, so now we're talking about data representation. Okay. Uh, so how do we actually represent geographic coordinates? What am I doing for time here? I might have to speed up a bit. So, vector data. Vector data is like points, lines, polygons. Everybody know the difference between vector and raster data? Kind of, yes. You guys aren't a very enthusiastic bunch. Um, so vector data, points, lines, and polygons, raster data, grids, images... Coverages, that type of thing. Um, here's a picture of points, lines, and polygons for New York City. Um, so for all of the examples that we're talking about, we're going to be using a spatial representation for vector data that is based on the Open Geospatial Consortium's simple feature specification. OK, this is a, like a global specification. How many people know what the Open Geospatial Consortium is? Kind of. You know, it's not. It's not. It's not important, actually. 
Um, they're the guys who decided that uh, it's kind of like ISO for geospatial stuff. In fact, they come up with ISO standards <coughs> for geospatial stuff. And one of those is a simple feature specification, okay, which is a way to specify simple vector features, okay, or vector geometry. Uh, there is also something called a well-known text representation, which we're going to play around with a little bit. Well-known text is just a textual representation of simple features. Okay? And then there's also a well-known binary specification or representation, which is a binary specification or binary version of well-known uh, feature or simple feature specification. Okay? So there's a text version and a binary version. The text version for a point is very simple, just point and then the x and y coordinates separated by space. Okay, that's how they are specified. Okay? And so any geospatial application that can understand simple features and well-known text should know what to do with that. Right? Now, they, we may have some internal representation that we use, but in the end we should know how to uh, exchange data using this specification. Okay? And then this is the well-known binary for this point which does not correspond at all with this picture here, which is a, uh, a polygon with a hole in it. But, you know, drawing one point is boring, right? So that's, that's the well-known text. This is the well-known binary. These things are going to come up later on, okay? But that's, okay, you know, like if I want to say, you know, make a point that's, you know, at x coordinate 2 and y coordinate 4, that's how you do it using simple features, okay? So it's a way to specify geometries. And pretty much all we need to know is this kind of point thing, and then we can extend that same kind of concept to different types of features, such as lines and polygons, and multiple <coughs> points, and multiple lines, and multiple polygons. And all we're doing is just adding a level of complexity, okay? So point is a point with two coordinates. A line, excuse me, is a line string with several sets of coordinates. Right, you've got a start point and then do 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 a couple of lines, 